She turned to me and said, I'm a Buddhist Christian. A what? She said, I'm a Buddhist Christian. And I said, tell me more. Welcome to Calm in the Chaos Interfaith Center, where we recognize many versions of spiritual connections. Just how can a person be a Buddhist Christian or a Christ-centered pagan or a Jew who loves Jesus? Let's explore some answers to that first one. The person we call Buddha was a wealthy man. He was a man of color who renounced his power and recognized that human life is one of suffering. He grew in his compassion for all beings and eventually became a teacher, modeling and teaching a way of life for people to be spiritually awakened. Buddha called for meditation, for spiritual and physical labor, and generally being a good person as the ways to lessen suffering and eventually achieve enlightenment. Buddha is not a god. The man we call Buddha was born as Siddhartha Gautama 623 years before Jesus was born. The word Buddha means enlightened. So technically, we can all become Buddhas if we work at it. To begin to understand Buddhism, we might take a look at the Four Noble Truths, the teachings that uh, Buddha was known for. Number one, life involves suffering. Number two, the cause of suffering is greed and ignorance. Number three, work on awakening our minds, recognizing the impermanence of things, and come together. And number four, suffering can end. Could a person follow this way of being and be a Christian? <laughs> I think so. I think yes. Because Buddhism is not a religion, it's a way of being spiritual. Buddha is not asking you to pray to him. Buddha presents a way of being that can enhance your life. Meditation, spiritual labor, physical labor, and being a good person all line up beautifully with what Jesus taught. Meditation can simply be sitting in solitude in silence, listening for the voice of God to speak to us. Or it can be a prayer. Some of my clergy friends call their Sunday morning remarks a meditation. And then there's spiritual labor. Isn't that what we do when we're listening to God talk or a podcast by a respected spiritual leader? Or when we subscribe to the daily writings of Father Richard Rohr? Aren't those the springboards for spiritual labor? And when we use the lessons we're learning, when we take to heart these new awarenesses and adopt them into the fabric of our daily lives, we are growing spiritually. Lastly, Buddhism promotes being a good person, thinking the right thoughts, speaking well of others, being a nonviolent person. This most assuredly lines up with following Jesus' teachings. I know a person can be a Buddhist Christian because the woman who taught Buddhism in seminary was a Buddhist Swami dressed in her saffron-colored robe, and she was a member of the local United Methodist Church. Bravo for sticking with me so far. You may be wondering, why does all this matter? I already know what I know, I believe what I believe, and this is just hogwash. Well, maybe not. Learning about the many ways of growing spiritually can do a couple of things. First, it may open our eyes and hearts to enrich our spiritual practices and expand our repertoire of ways to grow. Meeting people of different faith paths and allowing ourselves to participate in their prayers and meditations and rituals, the ways of being that are inherent to that faith, makes us bigger people. Education always does that. Second, learning about and participating in other faith traditions may have the effect of deepening our own knowing, solidifying what we believe is our path. In my experience, I feel much like the Swami, the Methodist. My go-to guy is Jesus, but I feel strongly that no religion has all the answers. No religion holds the only key to truth. I find that many religions hold sacred the oneness of humanity and the sacredness of life. I believe that great suffering and great healing, great wisdom and great love can be found in every religion's stories and sacred texts.
Faith teachings from many of the world's religions urge us to be calm, to forgive, to offer grace to one another, to be in community, to care for one another. Let's take a look at one example where faith paths overlap and having a broad knowledge of multiple teachings can give us spiritual depth. I'm going to use anger as the example. Anger and hatred that lead to harm are not part of any of the world's faith teachings that I know. Anger is an interesting spiritual topic. I gave a message on anger one Sunday a few years back and I mentioned that Jesus was a peace-loving man. Immediately following the Amen at the end of the final blessing, a man was standing by my side, anxious to remind me about Jesus' anger at the men who were doing business inside the temple. The story shows up in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. It sounds like this, verses 13 through 16. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. Some people call this the temple tantrum, but I'm not sure it was an angry outburst reaction to what Jesus saw. He may have known what was going on when he arrived in the city the day before. His actions were probably planned because verse 15 tells us he made a whip of cords. That takes a bit of time to do that. So I believe we could say his anger was controlled and his actions did not harm the people or animals involved. There are biblical scholars who note that the selling of animals in the temple was not uncommon as people needed to sell or buy animals for sacrifices. And because they came from various regions, the money changers were necessary to convert all transactions into a common unit of currency. Jesus may have been cleansing the temple as a prelude or a foretelling of what was going to happen to him. Only three verses later, he utters these words, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. Hmm. Back to the issue at hand, both Christianity and Buddhism teach us to be calm, to anger slowly, to remain centered and grounded. What does this mean for us? I used to look at the Dalai Lama and wonder how he could almost always be photographed with a slight smile on his face. And when he spoke, it was never ever with a voice raised in pitch or volume. He seemed to never show anger and maybe he doesn't. But we do. Yes, we humans get angry. It's almost impossible to not be angry right now, given the state of the world, our country, and our communities. I continue to feel anger towards people who have dug in their heels about the vaccine, from a noted Rochester oncologist who walked away when employee vaccine mandates were enforced at a local hospital, leaving 700 cancer patients in the hands of his already overworked colleagues to people who sit in the next booth at a restaurant. I'm angry. I'm angry at the unmasked person in line behind me at the store when mandatory masking signs are plastered on the entrance door, but employees are prohibited from saying something lest the customer become belligerent. I'm angry at people who use and manipulate others for their own gain. People in powerful positions as the CEOs of mega churches who drive expensive cars and live in mansions and use their church members as employees to raise the bottom line of their business. So what do we do with our anger? I look to the lessons from Jesus, the lessons from Buddha and others, and I live my life. Yes, a life that includes being angry. 
but balancing the anger, doing something about it, taking some action so I'm in balance within myself. I often say to unmasked people in stores, I have an extra mask in my car. If you need one, I'll gladly go get it. No one has ever challenged me or taken up a fight. No one has accepted my offer either, but at least I tried. Can a person be a Buddhist Christian? Sure. We can each follow the best of several faith traditions or adhere strictly to one path. It's our decision how to carve out our spiritual work. That's the beauty of religious freedom. We can analyze and contemplate the teachings we were raised with and choose to continue in that vein or to learn about other ways of spiritual growth. How do you identify? As a Jew? As an atheist who loves nature? As a Buddhist Christian? I invite you today to a guided meditation for healing. Guided meditation is not sitting in silence. Thoughts are encouraged by a spoken text. Blessings upon you.